Very, very good morning to you all and welcome to our worship here at St Andrews with Castlegate. Our worship is led for us today by our member and accredited lay preacher, Mark Hodgson. Mark, we thank you for being at the helm once again, two weeks running, and uh, preparing and leading us in worship this morning. Our service is being broadcast live on YouTube, and so we send our greetings to all of you who are able to join us from home this morning, and at the same time say a special welcome to any visitors here with us in church. Looking forward, most of our regular organisations meet as usual this week, but secretaries and coordinators of our different groups should also note that annual reports should be completed today, by today, and sent to Graham ideally before the end of the afternoon. Uh, Lent study groups are now up and running and there is still time to get involved but rather than me recite it here, full details are uh, given on page 7 of the March newsletter which is in pigeonholes this morning. Looking a little further ahead, the book group meet on Monday the 4th of March at 7.45 in the fellowship room and then next Sunday the 3rd of March our worship will be led by our minister and will include the sacrament of Holy Communion. Finally, following worship this morning, please do join us for coffee served downstairs in the fellowship room where you will also have an opportunity to purchase items from our fair trade store. The Lord invites us to follow him, so we take up our cross. The Lord invites us to grow in our relationship with him. We are his disciples. The Lord invites us to answer the question, who do you say that I am? Help us, Lord, to follow you. Help us, Lord, to to grow in faith. Help us, Lord, to meet you here. Let us worship God as we sing our first hymn this morning. Will you come and follow me as I but call your name? And now our prayers of approach and confession, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Forgive me, I'm going to try something a little different and ask you to use the modern words for the Lord's Prayer, 
These can be found on the inside back cover of your hymn books. And the reason for that is so that we look at and think of the words of the prayer rather than possibly falling into the trap of just saying them. Let us pray. A king, a protagonist, a prophet, a challenger, the Messiah, God with us. Yet others saw you differently, a threat, a rebel, a troublemaker, a poor man, an outcast. Lord, you are all these titles and more. But is there any value in the names we place on you when all you ask is, follow me? Help us to meet you, to know you, to follow you. Help us to follow you with our words, our actions and our lives. As we attempt to pick up our cross, support us, strengthen us, guide us so that we may follow in your ways of changing this world for the better. In our worship, be with us, sustain us, inspire us, Christ, Messiah, God. But all too often we forget who you are. We go our own ways and rely on our own strength. Forgive us, Lord. All too often we forget to carry our cross. We just leave it behind, hoping, or worse, expecting that someone else will be there to pick it up. Forgive us, Lord. All too often we forget ourselves. We do not take the time to grow in our faith, to understand your ways for the world. Forgive us, Lord. For those times and many others, conscious and unconscious, we ask for your forgiveness, Lord. Yet time after time, you let us know that in faith, in hope, in love, in you, loving God, we are forgiven. Praise be to God. And we pray together in the modern words the prayer Jesus taught all his disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 7, 15 to 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. 
I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Well, here we are, two Sundays into Lent, and spring is showing definite signs of arrival. The buds are out on the triffid growing outside our back door. Ha, did I say triffid? I meant tree peony. The daffodils and crocuses are showing a splash of bright colour against the green of the embankment. The mute swans are getting all fanciful and not living up to their names. And the black-headed gulls are gaining their summer plumage and looking like their name actually suggests. And speaking of names, the Old Testament Bible story we've just heard is all about names and their meanings and God changing the names of two people for a purpose. Abram's name meant exalted father. And God changed this to Abraham, which means father of many nations. Sarai's name meant my princess. While the change of name becomes a more formal way of saying she is a princess. I really like the derivation of words. A subject not necessarily shared with the rest of my family. You could probably hear the groans in Dundee if I ever mentioned, where does the word window come from? But names and their meanings are even more fascinating, if you like that sort of thing. During the assembly executive meeting a fortnight ago, one of the many topics covered in the chat outside the sessions was about the difficulty of folk having different names and specifically Phil, my wife's name and mine. In different circumstances, Phil is known as P, Pip, Phil, Pippa, Philippa, although my advice is not to call her that, <laughs> or even Piffalifalofalofalof Poff, for short, obviously. And yet, she is who she is, even when fulfilling these different roles. When I was at school, my middle name was used as an insult, and I was teased mercilessly about it. When I went to university, I thought, well, blow this for a game of soldiers. So I wore the middle name as a badge of honour and changed it to changed it to a double-barrelled surname, which is why I am Mark Goodwill Hodgson as an architect, but plain old Mark Hodgson as a church member. The bigger name is memorable, and this is quite useful professionally, although only if I do a good job. <laughs> and it gets me one letter earlier in the alphabet. Result. Phil did not fancy being Pilifalifalofalofalofpoff Mary Goodwill Hodgson because that would have been an extremely long name, although not as long as Puccini's. Hence the simple Mark Hodgson at church. And yet, I am who I'm meant to be. Our parents choose our names and most of the time we do not think to change them and simply live with them. Although Cher's daughter changed not only her name from chastity, but also became the man, Chaz, so he could be who he's meant to be. And I've checked, and those are the correct pronouns. Our daughter, Lizzie, was baptised Mary Elizabeth. But because in Pride and Prejudice, Mary was the boring one who played the piano somewhat badly. And Lizzie was the exciting one who won Mr. Darcy. That's that picture. 
because of who, uh, yes, sorry, uh, she fancied being the latter because of who she felt she was meant to be. But unlike when I went to university, she was not allowed simply to change her name when she started at Nottingham without going down the official route. So a deed poll later, and she is now legally Elizabeth Mary. Our names matter because that is how we are known and names have a meaning. Mark, consecrated to the god of war. Oh dear. Philippa, lover of horses, getting better. Elizabeth, God is my oath. But we are also known for who we are. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, as Juliet says, referring to Romeo, who was a Montague. We are who we are meant to be because we are created in God's image. And in being us, God wants us to fill our purpose by being more like Jesus the anglicised Greek form of Joshua, which means God saves. We hear the anthem from the choir, Arise and Shine Forth by Sally DeFord.
Well, that sounded fantastic on Thursday. Sounded even better this morning. Thank you, choir. We sing again from the hymn on your sheets, picking up on that theme of name and saving. Lord, I lift your name on high. be seated. Let us pray. Loving God, We give you thanks for all the wonderful gifts you have given to us. And though they are but a poor reflection, we offer these our gifts here and given in other ways, and also our lives in your service to build your kingdom here and throughout the world. We pray for the children and young people and their leaders as they go out to learn more about being themselves, people made in your image, and also to learn about becoming more like Christ Jesus. And we offer this prayer in his name. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, 
chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took them aside and be began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. John Bell, like in the first hymn, often sets his hymns to lilting Scottish melodies. Um, hymn 180, um, he has written his own lilting Scottish melody. Um, it's quite a simple tune, and I think you'll pick it up easily, um, but Jim is going to play the whole verse through once for us.
Mark's gospel reading describes Jesus beginning to look towards the showdown in the capital city. Having been preaching and healing in the northern area around Galilee, at this point in Mark's account, Jesus is setting his sights on the south, on Jerusalem, and attempting to tell his disciples what is going to happen there. The first part of the reading we heard has Peter demonstrating amazing insight when he calls Jesus the Messiah, the Hebrew word for Christ. Jesus tells him to keep this quiet. A major factor of Mark's life in Nero's Rome as part of that persecuted little Christian congregation was to know when to speak out and when to be secret. The world was not ready for such a revelation. Even the disciples do not really understand the implications of what Jesus is saying. When in the second part of the reading, Jesus tries for the first time to tell his disciples what is to come, Peter completely lacks the insight he has just shown and fails to understand. He rebukes Jesus for saying that the Son of Man will take the path of the suffering servant and die. Jesus' use of the name Son of Man is heaped with meaning. It picks up on an expression found in Ezekiel where it essentially means a human being. Or, in other words, an expansive way of saying, I. However, in Daniel's vision, describing another time of persecution, this time in Babylon, it is linked to God's authority and a coming to glory through weakness. You may recall the words at Jesus' trial which so outraged the high priest. I am... And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. When I say that quote, I can't help but hear Jerry Morris singing those words set in Stainer's crucifixion. If you ought to hear them again, the Monday after Palm Sunday evening. The Son of Man will take the path of the suffering servant and die. Wait a minute. A sentence of death was not part of the disciples' expectation of Messiah. There was nothing for these simple fishermen in their shared heritage of Messiah about being crucified and rising again. It was completely beyond their understanding. In their eyes... Surely the Jewish Messiah was to be all about saving and glory, like the great King David from whom the Messiah was to descend. For them, it was specifically about saving Israel from the oppressor Rome. But in whose eyes should this saving glory be viewed? Ours or God's? Jesus turns angrily on Peter and tells the Satan to get away from him. Is this uncharacteristic behavior because Peter's words carry a similar message to the tempting Jesus experienced in the desert immediately after God calls him my beloved son at his baptism? Are Peter's words a continuation of the guiles of the devil expressed during those 40 days in the wilderness? 40 days mirrored by this period called Lent that we mark as our preparation for Easter. Mark leaves the temptation of Jesus enigmatically incomplete in his gospel. Perhaps suggesting that the battle with temptation, of potentially taking the easy way and not God's way, follows the man Jesus to the end. We hear echoes of it in those agonized prayers in Gethsemane on the night before his arrest. 
when the disciples cannot stay awake to watch with him. Jesus prays to be spared from the bitter cup of self-sacrifice, but ultimately declares, not my will, but yours be done. He taught us to pray this in the words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. In context, immediately after this passage, the three inner circle disciples, including poor old fallible Peter, see a glimpse of future glory in the transfiguration, which Louise spoke about a fortnight ago. And again, Mark says, they are told to be silent about this because the time is not right. The devil-inspired easy route to success is not the way of the follower of Christ. Being successful in this world at the expense of following the way that God has shown us in the life, death and resurrection of God's Son is going to result in losing everything. Walk in the way of the world or walk in the way of God. Not an easy choice, but a simple one. Not taking, but giving. Doing what is right and not what is easy. Jesus gives it to us straight. He never was just a Mr. Nice Guy. He speaks harshly towards those in any position who simply seek power and influence and neglect truth and mercy and justice. And there seem to be a lot of those in the world today. There's a dog waste bin in Bridgeford Park that has been renamed Putin. We've heard a lot in the news recently because of the two-year anniversary of the special military operation. You cannot change a name. You cannot change the name of an ugly invasion simply to make it smell sweeter. It stinks. On the radio this morning, a Ukrainian put it simply but powerfully. Our message to the Russian Federation is, please leave us alone. Our message to the rest of the world is, please do not leave us alone. We can't do much here, but we can light the peace. Partly the reason why I did not do that earlier. The other one is I forgot. We can also fly the flag. Sky, rain. And we can pray. Pray for peace. Ukraine. You are not alone. Jesus teaches not just the twelve, but all of the crowd, and that includes us, to take up our cross and follow him. Not literally, of course, although in some cases it was. Taking up our cross means walking the sacrificial way, the way of Christ Jesus, the way of the suffering servant. This way brings true glory in the real life, the life everlasting, by doing what is right, not what is easy. It says a lot that the early Christians identified themselves by claiming a name for themselves which was originally used as an insult by the people of Antioch. 
In the early days, they called themselves followers of the way. As the movement spread north, the people of Syria called them contemptuously in Greek, Christianoi. How to diffuse the hatred in a name? By wearing it as a badge of honor. You call me Christian, so be it. I am a servant of Christ. I am a Christian. I am your servant. The sacrificial way is the real meaning of being a Christian. But never fear. The good news is that we have a place in God's kingdom, in the life everlasting by grace. But this is cemented by doing what is right and not what is easy. Perhaps Jesus teased the admission from Peter that he is the Messiah in order to be able to teach the disciples the real meaning of the name. This, of course, is the Peter who continues to be, like us, a fallible human, falling asleep in the garden, cutting off the high priest's servant's ear, even denying three times that he knows Jesus during the trials. And yet Jesus forgives him time and time again, 70 times seven. And Jesus does the same for us, loving and forgiving us, despite our failure to do what is right rather than what is easy. At the call of the disciples, Jesus changed that man's name for a purpose. From Simon, Shimon, Hebrew, it is heard, to Cephas or Peter, the rock. The foundation on which the church is built. And we maintain that line of discipleship as the living stones of our lives continue to build the church upon Peter's foundation. And in the end, Peter did take up his cross and was put to death for his faith in Christ. As Simon became Peter and followers of the way became Christians, the Genesis reading was also about name changing for a purpose, God's purpose and man's faith in God to know the fullness of events, to hold the long view. Again in context, the passage read today from Genesis, skips over the story of another of the covenants made with the patriarchs. Circumcision, a hidden sign, very personal. Quite unlike the rainbow covenant made with Noah and all of creation that Chris spoke about last week. Incidentally, circumcision was shared amongst many Middle Eastern tribes including the Ishmaelites, although clearly just the men, it is forgotten often that a Abram's other son, Ishmael, born by Hagar the maidservant, was the forefather of the Arab races. So not that much difference between Arab and Jew, just cousins, Perhaps it is the proximity or that fine difference which is the trigger for the excessive hatred. City, United. Derby, Nottingham. Mr. Bates and the post office. Russian, Ukrainian. Israeli, Palestinian. I do not think this slight difference excuses the hate. I believe it makes it worse. Was it flippant to include Mr. Bates in my list? The football and city references, maybe. But the truth is that the Horizon mess was also a bit of cultural nastiness. Back in the 19th century, when the post office expanded... It needed people to run things at a local level. But the sub-postmasters and mistresses were always, always suspected as being cheats. 
by the organization of which they were a part, simply because a little bit of the power had had to be given away from the center. Decades later, when it came to trusting them or a computer which, quotes, can never be wrong, it was the poor, innocent individuals who were given the blame. When will we learn and simply see the true humanity in all other people? In all other people. When will we hush the noise and hear the angels singing the way of love? When will we do what is right, not what is easy? We have a new covenant and we have been given a new sign, a sign which is often laid out and shared at this table. This is the new covenant, sealed in the sacrificial blood of our servant King Christ Jesus, the bread and wine of remembrance enriched by the empty cross of resurrection. We believe this is the true covenant made by a humble God, offering costly terms of peace and love. This covenant is about love, but a particular type of love. C.S. Lewis writes of the four types, family love, friendly love, romantic love, and ultimately the Greek word agape, a selfless spiritual love, the way of the suffering servant, a love which never fails and always loves always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. It is a love that is patient and kind. It does not boast. It is not proud or rude. It does not seek for self's sake. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil because it rejoices in the truth. The disciples had truly understood the name Messiah to mean something entirely different from God's intent. And Jesus tried to explain its real substance to them so many times. Perhaps he only succeeded in portraying the truth in his act of sacrifice on the cross and the resurrection on the third day. That true meaning of Messiah is difficult for us to comprehend today, even with two, nearly 2,000 years of hindsight, and even more so to acknowledge the impact its meaning ought to have on our lives. In the reality of that promised life everlasting, we shall understand God because we shall have put away the boundaries of earthly life and we shall see face to face. We will not be apart from God, but dwell in God. Dwell in the creating and sustaining power of love forever and ever. To quote a song from an unexpectedly successful film, we need to ask ourselves the question, what am I made for? We are here for a purpose, made as we are in the image of God, and we need to choose how to live this life. This God-given life is created for giving and spending, not for grasping and hoarding. The latter path leaves to a life everlasting without God. All eternity, not knowing the creating and sustaining power of love, that would be hell indeed. The former way, the way shown to us in Christ Jesus, doing what is right, not what is easy, means we should be truly worthy of the name, truly worthy of the insult, Christian. 
Amen. We sing the hymn at Rejoice and Sing number 373, Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to us. And now our prayers for the world, its people, and ourselves. Let us pray. Take up your cross. What does that mean for us? Who does it mean for us? Lord, there are so many people, places, and situations which need your love. Help us to know where to start. You challenge us to take up our cross, but what do you mean? Do you mean that we need to bring about your kingdom? Do you mean that we need to share your love? Do you mean that we need to restore relationships? Of course, you mean all of these and more. Lord, when we take up our cross... Help us. Help us to do what is right rather than what is easy. Help us to know what to do, who to be with, who to pray for, who to love. 
we should know that these are the ones you came for. The lonely, the lost, the unloved, the shunned, the strange, the addicted, the unwell, the homeless, the poor, the war-torn, the migrant. Help us to see that all are your people, made in your image, and thus your beloved people, and whom you have saved with us. You love all people, showing this through your Son, the Messiah, the Christ. Help us to do likewise, to follow in his way as we pick up our crosses and love, love those whom you love so dearly. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, At the Name of Jesus, Every Knee Shall Bow, number 261 in Rejoice and Sing. We go from here walking the way of Christ, sharing the Messiah's good news, prepared to take up our crosses and be a people of God made in God's image and prepared to do what is right, not what is easy, named and known by God.
And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and remain with us all, now and forever. Amen. Amen.